I'd like to start by introducing the next speaker. <laughs> Please welcome my friend, Kevin. Oh my God! Where is this? This is a lecture. Oh, again? What am I doing here? Well, Kevin, you helped me make a very important point. Really? Cool. What's that? Well, it's a point about social perception. See, people in the audience look at you and they perceive awareness. Uh-huh. Yes. And that perception is automatic. We can't help it. It looks like you're conscious of the world around you. Ah, but the interesting thing is, Intellectually, at the same time, we know it's not true. It's a social illusion. You don't have a brain. What? Yes, I do. No, no, you don't. Dude, check it yourself. How would I check that? Uh, just stick your other hand in my back and feel around. Really? Yeah. Pretend you're a proctologist. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Ow, sorry. <laughs> yep, that's it. <laughs> Kevin, your, your brain is detached from your body. Well, you took it out, jerk. All right, I think it's time to put you away so I can get on with my talk. What? Oh, man. Yes. No. No, don't. <coughs> don't worry, I'll put his brain back. He'll be fine. Thank you. I, uh, I started to learn ventriloquism when my son was three. It's a perfect age. He was too young to know how bad I was. I, uh, I used to make his stuffed animals talk. And as I got better, I began to realize something scientifically profound. The brain contains machinery that allows us to attribute awareness to Kevin, but we didn't evolve that machinery to enjoy ventriloquism. I mean, people are social animals, and we do the same thing to each other. We attribute consciousness to each other. When I talk to another person, I have an automatic impression of thoughts and emotions and awareness emanating from that person. Of course, that's not the person's real mind. That's my brain generating a handy model of a mind and projecting it onto the person. Whenever two people meet, four people are present. Me, you, the version of you I project onto you, and the version of me you project onto me. That's four sometimes very different people. And we do the same thing to more than just people. We attribute awareness to our pet cats and dogs. That's reasonable. Uh, some people swear that their house plants are conscious. Heck, the other day I got mad at my computer. So I'm not talking about intellectually figuring out whether something has a mind like a standard Turing test challenge. Instead, I'm talking about that automatic gut intuition, which is often wrong, but persuasively potent, of awareness emanating from something. And there's another obvious example. We attribute awareness to ourselves with the same automatic gut certainty. The intuition is even stronger because we have so much more continuous information on ourselves. So maybe it's all one thing. We attribute awareness to puppets and people and ourselves with the same machinery. Maybe there's one unifying explanation for the whole range of spirit stuff. The brain constructs simple social models of minds and uses them to understand itself and its world. These are the insights that come from talking to stuffed animals. And it's also how I began my scientific work on consciousness. 
For 30 years, I studied basic issues in neuroscience, how the brain processes sensory input, how it controls movement, and that background turned out to be useful in building a scientific theory of consciousness. I should really say a theory of subjective experience. Why is it that we don't just process information like a standard computer, but we claim to have an experience of it? For the past 10 years, my lab at Princeton University has been outlining what we call the attention schema theory, and I'll give you a quick sense of it. The brain is a model builder. You know about the world and about yourself only because your brain has constructed bundles of information, models. But the brain's models are not accurate. They're quick and dirty. They're efficient. For example, white light is a mixture of all colors. But for a long time, nobody knew that because the brain's simplified model is pure brightness without any contaminating colors. Here's another example. You have a physical arm, and you have a model of an arm constructed in your brain. It's called the arm schema. That model is imperfect. It's lacking in structural details, and it can make mistakes. There are illusions where you think your arm is here, but it's really there. Or if you have an amputation, your brain may still register the arm as present, a phantom limb. Well. There is always a distinction between reality and what the brain registers. So let's apply that principle to consciousness. There must be two kinds of consciousness, the kind the brain really has and the kind the brain thinks it has, and those are going to be different from each other. I call them I consciousness and M consciousness. I for information, M for mysterious. Here's how eye consciousness works. Let's say you're looking at something, an apple. Visual information from the apple is processed, it's enhanced, and it reaches a central network in the brain, sometimes called the global workspace. That apple information can now impact your speech so you can say that you see it. It can impact your motor cortex so you can reach for the apple. It can impact your cognitive decision-making. I consciousness is about how information reaches that central network where it can directly impact output systems. It's entirely mechanistic. You could build it artificially, and people are beginning to. But the philosophers tell us we're not done yet. I consciousness entirely leaves out the mysterious experiential side Maybe you've heard of the hard problem of consciousness. We don't just process the Apple information, we also claim to have a subjective experience, an inner non-materialistic feel. Where does that come from? Here's what we think is going on. In addition to a global workspace, the brain contains a system relatively well mapped out by now called the theory of mind network. It constructs information, it builds models about people's minds. Part of its job is to reconstruct the contents of other people's minds, the emotions, the beliefs, the uh, intentions. But part of its job is to build a simplified model of what a mind is in the first place. What does it mean for 86 billion neurons to process something in depth? In that highly simplified model that your theory of mind network constructs, you contain an invisible energy-like essence that can take active holds of items by having a subjective experience. And it can energize you to move and act. It's the ghost in the machine. It's M consciousness, the mysterious side of consciousness. That picture constructed by your brain is not accurate. It's a quick and dirty model that evolution has given us. And all the work in my lab is focused on that particular self model that the brain constructs. So 
I consciousness is the physical mechanistic consciousness the brain actually has. M consciousness is the mysterious non-materialistic essence the brain thinks it has. And the hard problem of consciousness is a set of irrational beliefs that derive from the brain's inaccurate self-model. Here's another way to put it. If you want a computer to be conscious the way we are, it's not enough to give it complex information processing. You also have to give it a theory of mind network so that it can build that beautiful model, that inaccurate, simplistic, but beautiful model of what a mind is. Then the machine will think it has a mysterious consciousness, just like we think that we do. This explanation with its multiple layers, I consciousness and M consciousness, the uh, global workspace and the theory of mind network, this picture is a convergence of many modern theories from neuroscience and psychology that have meshed together into a kind of potential standard model of consciousness. I know it's common for people to say, oh, nobody really understands consciousness. Maybe we never will. I think people say that because a lot of people have a vested interest in maintaining the mystery. But I don't think that's true. I think we actually do know what consciousness is, at least in its general outlines. But what impact will that kind of scientific insight have on us? A little while ago, I applied for a grant. The application had a question. How do I think my work compares to the most prominent work in the last five years? So I wrote, the work in my lab is the most important work in the last four billion years. <laughs> they were not amused. I did not get that grant. <laughs> but joking aside, there's a part of me that actually believes that, and I'll tell you why. About four billion years ago, non-living chemistry transitioned into life, and a second profound transition is happening right now in our own time, the development of artificial intelligence that is potentially trillions of times smarter than any person ever was. And more than that, we're moving slowly toward a technology that could take the human mind and migrate it from a brain to an artificial platform. Think about that. Instead of dying, we go to a digital afterlife. A person's thoughts and personality, emotions and memories, a person's wisdom would be able to live indefinitely, able to contribute to society for thousands of years. Think what that would do to cultural turnover or the accumulation of knowledge. It would change everything. For example, we are not a spacefaring species, and it's hard to imagine how we ever really can be. Our bodies are fragile, and we don't live long enough to go anywhere interesting. But all those problems are solved if we can take the most human part of us, the essence, the mind, and migrate it to an artificial device. The only way we become a truly ranging spacefaring civilization is not by building a spaceship environment to house the human body, but instead building a platform to carry the human mind. There will come a time when that seems completely normal. The mind is algorithms and information, and it should be able to live just as well on one or another platform. It's an astonishing future. It's a new phase of existence. But no matter how sophisticated our gadgets become, if we don't understand consciousness, if we don't understand how to engineer it, that future is impossible. But I think we do begin to grasp consciousness at an engineering level. That's why I think the work in my lab and other labs, this general work on the mechanistic basis of consciousness, is the crucial ingredient in a profound transition. The watershed moment in the history of our species is the moment that we understand consciousness well enough to build it. 
I'll end with a comment from an expert. <laughs> well, Kevin, what do you think? Dude, don't ask me. My PhD is on banana agriculture. <laughs> oh, well, in that case, thank you all. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>